1947, Glenn Chambers, a young man, boarded a flight first from New York to Miami, and then a flight from Miami to Quito, where he was looking forward to serving as a missionary. It had been a lifelong dream of his to take the gospel and do some radio broadcasting, and the opportunity had now arisen for him to do this. As he had his layover in the Miami airport, he looked around trying to find a scrap of paper on which he could write a quick, brief note to his mother. And the only scrap of paper that he could find was this piece from a magazine that was torn out and it said, why? So surrounding the word why, Glenn Chambers wrote a little note to his mother, surrounding it, filling it out, folding it up, putting it in an envelope, addressing it, and mailing it off to his mother. He would get on his flight, and they would begin the flight from Miami, but never arrive in Quito. Because over the mountains of Colombia, just outside Bogota, at 14,000 feet, That DC-4 would slam into a mountain, killing all the passengers and careening down into the deep ravine and valley below. A couple weeks later, when Glenn's mother went and picked up the mail, there was a letter from her now deceased son. And when she opened it, the question on the page that was had her son's words written around it, screamed out at her more than her son's words spoke to her. The question, why? This is what all sufferers ask. Why? Why me? Why my loved one? Why are they going through mental health struggles? Why does my senior relative have dementia? Why do I have chronic pain? Why me? And at points in our lives, this question can become so hard and so all-encompassing that it can be actually painful, that no answer seems to satisfy. And Job 19 is the why question. Of all places, it's this honest wrestling that Job has with his own suffering. Job, if you'd recall, if you know a little bit about his story, Job is from the time of Abraham. So though we've moved forward in the Bible in terms of pages towards the middle of the Bible, we're actually going back in time to where we, we've come from. Job exists and lives around the time of Abraham. And we know that because the friends that come to visit him, they have connections and relatives to Abraham at the beginning of the book. And Job is a man who has experienced tremendous wealth, and success, and prosperity, and he is a man of recognition. And yet, in one day, everything just is lost. His children die in a horrendous accident. His livestock and fields and everything that he owns, destroyed, stolen, taken away, servants killed, and all that remains is Job. And on top of that, as Job grieves all of these losses, he then goes through an experience of hell where he gets boils covering him from head to foot and is in agony and pain. And Job is a man who deals honestly and wrestles with the hard questions of suffering. Why? He won't just ignore it and brush it off and just grin and bear it, but rather he deals with this suffering. He has some friends who come to, quote-unquote, help him. Three friends at first, and we find a fourth at the end. And these friends come to help Job. First, they sit with him for a week, and they say nothing. They're incredible friends. They bear with him in his grief and in his dust and his ashes. And as he mourns and grieves and is in pain and agony, his friends sit there. And then after a week, his friends begin to probe. Because his friends have a, an understanding of how the universe works. They're, the friends, you see, they, they have this idea that the way that the universe works is that whatever you put in is what you get out. So like a computer programmer, garbage in, garbage out. 
Or, as some people would call it, it's almost like karma. You get what you deserve. You do bad, you get bad back in return. They have no understanding of any sort of innocent suffering or redemptive suffering or that suffering happens to people in a way that is not because they've done something. They only understand the world in terms of input and output. What you get put in, you get out. And so they begin to process with Job, what have you done? What have you done to deserve all this? How have you sinned? What evil, what secret sin have you done, Job, that's so horrendous that you deserve all of this pain? And Job, in this chapter, he pleads his case. He pleads his case, but he's in tremendous agony. In verses 1 through 12, he really is asking the question, is God against me? He wrestles with this because he can't understand how he can be one who has done what is right and what is acceptable and yet suffers. He complains to God and cries out, is God against me? Verses 1 through 6. Verse 7, he says, it's like God is a mugger and I'm calling out, there's violence and no one comes to rescue me. Verses 8 through 12, he says, it's like I'm a city that's being besieged, a, a city with walls and being surrounded so that no supplies can go in and out and I'm being attacked and cut off and there's no hope for me. To make matters worse, in verses 13 through 20, Job complains and says, it's not only that it feels like God is against me, it also feels like I'm being isolated from everyone. I'm, I'm being cut off. At first, it's his own relatives. They don't want anything to do with him. It's his brothers who reject him. It's the servants that he's had who despise him because he's so pathetic. And even his own wife, doesn't want get to get close to him, to be close to his breath, we're told. And Job in this is like, God's against me, and now I'm suffering in isolation. This is what happens in suffering. Suffering has this way of making you feel like you're completely alone. Psalm 88, it says that darkness is my closest friend. That no one is near to me. That I, I feel that not only is God absent, but he's against me. And not only do I feel like God is against me, but everyone abandons me. It's hard when you suffer because people, the, the person who suffers often feels like, you just want to fix me. A and I, I need to sit in my sorrow and my grief and my pain. But it feels like what people want to do is they want to fix you and change you and make you to, to be all right, so as to somehow get therapy that your suffering doesn't affect me so much. Yet Job, in the midst of this chapter, he has tremendous faith and tremendous hope. What gives Job this incredible hope? And what ought we to find hope in? And I want us to see two things. Two things that we learn from Job that help us, either in the face of suffering or for those who are suffering. And the first is this, that when we are facing suffering, don't doubt in the darkness what you learn in the light. In, in this chapter here, Job uh, 19, verse 21, Job begins by saying, Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O you my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. From Job's experience, having lost everything, his children, his wealth, even his own health, it feels like the hand of God is against him. The finger of God, the hand of God against me. But if we read the whole book of Job, what we actually have is the curtain is peeled back in chapters 1 and 2, and we get a little picture as to what's really going on. In chapter 1, Satan comes into the council, the throne room of God, and he says to God, your hand of protection is over Job. And the reason that Job worships you and loves you is because your hand of protection is on him. If you were to remove your hand of protection and your hand was to strike and afflict him, he would curse you and he would not follow you. And again... In Job 2, Satan comes along again and makes this accusation. 
And in Job 1, verses 11 and 12, and Job 2, verses 5 and 6, the Lord says, if you think that Job only worships me because my hand is on him, then let your hand strike him. And what Job doesn't understand in the darkness is that it's the hand, not of God, that's against him, but the hand of Satan. Though it's under the limitations of God, God says, you cannot strike him dead. But it is Satan's hand that is against Job. And as a result of this, when Job says, the hand of God has touched me, he thinks that it is God who is against him. And yet, in spite of his experience, in spite of all the data that lays out, all of the knowledge that Job has, and all of the argumentation of his friends, you must have done something. That's why you suffer. Job says, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh, God is not vindictive like that. God is not a meanie. He is not one who is quick to pour out wrath like that. God is not a moral monster to do evil. God is good, and I am innocent of doing wrong. Now, Job isn't saying, I'm sinless. That's not at all what he's saying, but he's saying to his friends, listen, there's nothing that I have clearly done that merits the suffering that I'm experiencing. Nothing. But Job's friends They insist there must be something that you've done. And so Job begins by saying, I need a defense. I need a defense because in verse 2 of chapter 19, Job had said, he had said these words, how long will you torment me and break me in pieces with your words? Their words just keep tearing him down. Instead of helping him and comforting him and encouraging him, their words just make his suffering worse. It's your fault. You must have done something. And instead of their words, Job says in verses 23 and 24, Oh, that my words would be written down. That they'd be put in a book. That I want my case to be defended. And I want it to be remembered. Because long after I'm gone, and when I'm in the grave, my my friends are going to say, Job, R.I.P., rest in peace, you poor soul, You were a pitiful sinner who did lots of wrong. But I don't want people to think that I was a sinner when there's nothing that I can clearly point to that I've done. Instead, Job says, I want it written down in a book. Even better, I want it recorded on stone, he says in verse 24. I want it etched in stone so that it is always remembered. It's remembered that my cause can be defended. And in a world where we feel like friends and family, the devil, and even God himself, it feels like he's against us. When the face of God is hidden, that's not the time to start shaping your beliefs about God. That when you go into the dark places of life, When your mind is darkened, when it feels like God is distant, what do you recall? What you've learned in the light. You recall the character of God, who you learned about when times were good. Maybe for you, times are good right now. You're not experiencing suffering. And that means that this is the time that you need to prepare because it's not if suffering will come, it's when it will come. Hardship will come. Hardship does come. And so it is important in these good moments to be building up that knowledge of what is God like? What is his character like? So that when we go into the darkness, that we do not doubt what we've learned in the light. And this becomes so critical. We're learning this even in our own day and in our own country, aren't we? That that we weren't prepared for a global pandemic and now's not the time for us to prepare. Now's the time where we're scrambling. We, we know this practically, so we ought to do this spiritually too. When times are good, we prepare for the hard times. It's wise, it's right. 
And so Job here is reminding us, don't doubt in the darkness what you've learned in the light. But the second thing that Job reminds us of is that we live by faith to enhance our sight. Now, we often think live by faith and not by sight. But I want to suggest to you that we live by faith to enhance our sight. Job moves from a wish in verse 23. He says, Oh, verse 23, that my words would be written. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in a rock forever. He's wishing. He's wishing that he could be defended forever by his words being written. He's wishing and hoping and thinking and praying, planning and dreaming. But in verse 25, he has something that is not a wish, but it is a confidence. You see how he moves from, oh, that I wish, to, for I know. Now we come to this rock, solid, grounded, rooted truth that Job suddenly turns to in the face of all difficulty, and he says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. Now a Redeemer in the Old Testament We need to understand what a Redeemer is. This is the first thing that gives him a confidence to look into the future with hope and joy and expectation. First, he has a Redeemer. A Redeemer in the Old Testament was a person who was bound to you by a covenant. So either by relationship or by an agreement, they were absolutely bound to you in covenant relationship. As strong as what we would call like a marital relationship. Not necessarily marriage here, but a covenant of bond. And they would do several things. We know from the story, we'll see it in a couple weeks in the book of Ruth, that if you uh, were a widow, for example, and in the ancient world, when you were a widow, you would have had no means of employment, uh, no social security, nothing to protect you. A redeemer would come and he would provide for you, care for you. In the case of Ruth, facing starvation, facing impending death, Boaz is her redeemer who comes, shelters her under his arm, and ultimately marries her. For others, a a redeemer would be one who, if you lost your property, that maybe you ran into financial difficulty and you had great distress, and you lost your property, a redeemer would be the one who would defend you by redeeming your property, purchasing it back for you, getting it back so that you would have a place. Or in the worst case scenario, if someone killed you, murdered you, a redeemer would be the one who would ensure that that person who murdered you was brought to justice and taken into the courts. A redeemer, in other words, was one who defended your cause and your name and vindicated you. And so when Job looks into the future, he says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand, verse 25, at the last he will stand upon the earth. Even better than me being defended and having everything written down in a book or on a stone, even better is that I have a Redeemer, and he's going to stand on my grave once I die. And so when my friends make accusations, there lies Job, the pathetic sinner. He must have done tons of wrong, and that's why he suffered. I'm going to have a Redeemer who's going to stand and defend me on my very grave, and he's going to defend me forever. My Redeemer lives is the, imp- is the idea that he's not just going to stand there for a few days or a few weeks. He stands there forever. I have a living Redeemer. But the second thing that Job has hope in is not just that he has a living Redeemer who's going to defend him, but he says, and I shall see him. Three times. In verses 26 and 27, he says, I'll see him. My eyes shall behold him. I shall see him. I shall see God. The Redeemer that Job has is God himself. God is his defense. God is his vindicator. God is the one who is going to stand on his grave and defend him against all accusations. When all hell has broken loose against Job, when all accusations come against him, Job is going to depend upon a God that he sees. And this is why we live by faith to enhance our sight. Because Job is, in essence, saying, 
I am going to see God and trust that he is good and that he is not a moral monster and that I am not being repaid for some unknown evil that I'm, I've done, that I don't understand, but in the darkness, I am going to hold on to who God is. I'm going to grasp on to him and hang on to him for all I've got. And I'm going to trust that just as a redeemer is bound to the one who suffers and defends their cause, so God is bound to me and I to him in covenant relationship. And I have a right relationship with God. And my friends can say all otherwise. But the truth of the matter is simply that God is my defender. He knows me. And I'm going to hold on to him. And my eyes will see him even when I can't see him now. It's the eyes of faith that see God. Because God is my defense, and God is good. How on earth do you come to believe this? The way that we believe this, the way that we believe that God is good in the face of trial and pain and suffering and hardship is that there was another innocent man who suffered, who had done no wrong. He became a victim, in a sense, of the greatest injustice in the world. He was falsely accused, condemned at trial, and though having done no wrong, was nailed to a cross, and he was put in a grave, But he had a, I use this word loosely, a redeemer who defended him, who vindicated him. He was raised on the third day. And in being raised on the third day, God was vindicating his son, Jesus, who had borne all suffering, though innocent himself, who suffered all wrong, though he had done no wrong, who bore in himself, in his body on that tree, all of the curses and pains, though he deserved none. And God raised him from the dead. And by raising him and keeping that tomb empty, vindicates him and says his work was righteous and good. And defends his son, even though all hell had broken loose against him and though he deserved none of it. And now he says, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. The grave remains empty to give you the hope that in the face, whether you suffer or someone you love suffers, that God is your vindication. God is your defense. God is your hope. And though suffering stings, and it stings bitterly, and it is painful, we know that when God is our defender, that in the face of trial, we have a Redeemer. And our Redeemer lives. And He lives for you and for me, even this day. Which is why we have the hope of the resurrection always.